Have you ever wondered why moose are only found up north? Or why in areas where you find a lot of white-tailed deer, you're often hard-pressed to find caribou, elk, or even mule deer? Well, obviously all these different deer species have evolved to live in different niches that allow them to succeed in the varied environments that are present in North America. However, what if I told you that one of the main factors that ensures these deer species don't overlap is a 3 inch long worm? Now this isn't your standard earthworm, no I'm talking about meningeal worms, also known as deer brain worms, which is a common parasite found in white tailed deer that can cause catastrophic damage to moose, mule deer, elk, and even some domestic species. Now in this video I'm going to be going over the biology and ecology of this worm, its life cycle and how it may be making moose populations go extinct in some regions. So brain worms. Well, we're not talking about those brain worms today, but I will be making a video on those types of parasites later, so make sure you subscribe so you can see more parasite related videos. No, today I'm talking about deer brain worms, which are a type of nematode parasite that is actually super common in white tailed deer. Now this parasite, the brain worm, or as its Latin name is, Paralophostrongylus tenius, is a nematode, which is a common type of parasite often characterized by looking relatively simple with no segments, but instead a tough, flexible, acellular exoskeleton called a cuticle that keeps them safe from environmental stress. Now most nematodes aren't parasitic, in fact there are a ton of non-parasitic nematodes with a famous quote saying that if you were to remove everything from the world except for nematodes, you would still be able to see the outline of the earth just because there's that many nematodes. But at the same time there are also a ton of parasitic nematodes, like the common ones found in humans, such as hookworms, whipworms, pinworms, just to name a few. However all these parasites live in the gut where they can both feed, have sex, and reproduce where the deer brain worms have a little bit of a unique residence. That's right, you guessed it, the deer brain worms, surprisingly, like to live on the brain of deer. However, to be more precise, they like to live in the veins and the venous sinuses on the surface of the deer's brain. Here the worms will mature and start making little babies, but now I'm sure you're wondering, if they live in the brain, how the hell do the parasites get from one deer to the next? Well, in their new homes, when a daddy worm and a mommy worm love each other very much, they will start to release eggs. Now these eggs will hatch in the veins of the deer, and then they release what's called an L1 larvae. Now an L1 larvae is just a baby worm, it looks pretty much the same as an adult worm, just much smaller. And these larvae will then be carried away by the bloodstream. Well, after some time going through the blood, the larvae will eventually end up getting caught in the small capillaries of the lungs. Once the parasites get caught in the capillaries, they will actually start to leave the bloodstream and they will start to enter the lungs of the deer. Now, by entering the lungs they can irritate the deer a bit and this will cause it to cough as one does when they're sick or they have some kind of irritant in their lungs. And by doing this, the deer is actually unintentionally coughing up these parasites into its mouth. From there, the parasite just rides the digestive system until it's eventually passed in the deer's poop. Fairly simple, right? But unlike my dog, deer don't tend to eat deer poop, so how does this parasite still get from the poop into the next deer? Well similar to my gross dog when he's unsupervised, I still love him though, snails and slugs also love to eat deer poop, and this is where the life cycle of the parasite begins to take place. Inside these gastropods, the parasite larvae begin to grow. After this, the parasite starts to wait, and what's it waiting for? Well, it's waiting for a deer to accidentally eat the slug or snail that it's currently in. See, deer don't intentionally eat slugs or snails, however, there are a lot of snails out there, and they often like to hang out under leaves, and as a result, the deer often get a little extra protein when munching on some leaves. By doing this, the parasite is brought back home, and in the gut of the deer, the snail will be digested, but the nematode is protected by its cuticle and left unharmed. Now, once liberated from the snail or the slug, the parasite larvae will then penetrate out of the gut of the deer, and then they travel along the spine of the deer until it reaches the brain. Here the parasite will then lodge itself into the veins around the brain, and it will start to mature. Now, although this sounds pretty invasive and brutal, if you're a white-tailed deer, there's actually surprisingly little pathology associated with this parasite. The vast majority of deer are left completely unscathed, with many areas reporting over 50% of the deer are infected with at least one worm. Now the reason this worm causes so little pathology in white-tailed deer is that it's highly adapted to its host and that it's evolved over countless generations to cause very little pathology in the deer as the longer the deer survives, the longer the worm will survive as well, as it needs its host to be able to survive so it can reproduce inside of its brains. Now this is often called the virulence evolution theory or sometimes also known as the trade-off hypothesis where parasites continuously evolve to do less damage to their hosts to improve both their survival and their host survival 
This often requires the parasite to evolve highly specific strategies to avoid hurting their hosts. However, what happens if this parasite ends up in the wrong host? Well, this is what often occurs to moose that become infected with this worm. Just like in the deer, the parasite will leave the gut of the moose and then it will travel along its spine making its way to its brain. However, unlike the deer, the parasite isn't very adapted to living in a moose and as a result it causes lots of inflammation and this can result in partial or full paralysis in the moose. Now it's stated that some moose can recover from this infection and go back to normal functioning. However, because the parasite can directly kill a large percentage of them and because it also makes them highly prone to predation, it's unlikely that moose will survive. And similar occurrences happen in mule deer or elk that get infected with this parasite, where they get some form of paralysis which can directly kill the animals or can result in them getting more predated upon. As I mentioned before, this parasite is fairly common in deer. So when white-tailed deer start to push into new territory, they oftentimes bring this worm with them. And while obviously any moose could easily best deer in an outright confrontation, if deer density starts to get too high, so will these worms and moose just can't stay in the area. Now there are certain factors that increase the likeliness of a deer pushing moose out. For example, snails and slugs don't do well in dry climates. So without these key players, the moose are at no risk, making rainfall and gastropod populations two strong predictors that decide if moose and deer can inhabit the same area or if moose will go locally extinct. Now with this in mind, we can start talking about more specifics. For example, Minnesota has had an estimated 60% decline in their moose populations from the mid-2000s to the current day, with some studies suggesting that close to 90% of annual mortality is due to disease impacting moose. Now in regards to these declining moose populations, climate change is often regarded as one of the main factors. And that's not because moose can't survive in these slightly warmer climates, but it's actually just allowing white-tailed deer to set up residency along the moose's southern range border. Now, if it's only a few deer, that's really no issue as you need to have a certain density of deer to really allow for efficient transmission of this parasite. However, as these winters are beginning to get shorter and warmer, it's permitting deer to persist in higher densities in this northern area with longer wetter growing seasons also allowing the increase in gastropod abundance, putting moose at greater risk. Simultaneously, these shorter, wetter winters are also leading to the increase in other diseases such as winter ticks, which are believed to also have a pretty strong impact on moose populations, particularly for the younger moose. Besides wild animals, deer brainworm is also known to impact some domestic animals as well, including sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, and camels, where treatment can be quite difficult, though not impossible. Now, regular deworming can help prevent these parasites from becoming an issue, as well as keeping exposure to white-tailed deer and gastropods limited for these domestic animals. Fortunately though, this parasite doesn't seem to have any impact on more common domestic animals like dogs or cats, and more importantly, there has never been a reported case in humans either, making sure that people are safe even if they're going around eating snails. Although it's unfortunate this parasite can be really devastating to moose, elk, and mule deer, there are still some extremely strong populations of these animals in different areas that white-tailed deer will likely never be able to really get a foothold in. For example, areas like Alaska or Northern Canada, there are some extremely strong moose populations and they're likely to persist because white-tailed deer are very unlikely to ever make their way to Alaska. Additionally, some have suggested that we might need to increase our culling efforts on white-tailed deer or just increase the hunting efforts on white-tailed deer to help prevent their range expansion into these northern environments as it's really upsetting to see local moose populations going extinct. Regardless of the efforts that are taken, I think these parasites really demonstrate how a simple infection can drastically change the ecology of a region and how integral parasites are to wildlife management. Now to all of you that are still watching, thank you for watching the full video, I hope you liked it and found out some cool information. I personally find this parasite to be a really cool way to understand how parasites can influence ecology of an animal or species, but if you liked this video, please let me know and please subscribe so you can see more parasite related videos coming soon.